Okay. It's up to you. Thank you. Um, just before I start the lecture, I'm going to hold up to the screen two stones so that you can um, see what I'm talking about this evening. This is a big lump or well, lump of iron conglomerate, um, which is going to be featuring this evening quite a lot. This is a stone which can be dug out of uh, river gravels mainly. Um, it's formed by iron oxide consolidating the, the gravels and the sands and forming solid lumps. And when you dig them out, um, I think it's fairly soft when it comes out, but then if you give it a chance to dry and uh, it then hardens and you can sh trim it and, and form it into very useful uh, building blocks. That's it's called uh, iron conglomerates or ferricrete or um, pudding stone or um, iron pan, all sorts of things. Uh, this other stone, um, if we were in bright sunlight, you would actually see the quartz crystals glinting in it. You probably can't under my angle poise, but I promise you it would in bright sunshine. And this is a, the other building stone uh, that I'll be talking about um, that was quarried at Castle Rising in West Norfolk. Right. Um, right. <clears throat> so the talk this evening is about Norfolk's first stone churches. Um, the, the word first is a, is a critical word. I could say early stone churches, but what do I mean by that? I'm approaching this, I should say, as a, a field archaeologist who has had very little to do with churches until recently, and I found it a fascinating subject. I'm not an architectural historian. I'm a field archaeologist and trying to discover what's in these churches, uh, which makes them especially interesting. Um, and I'm enormously grateful to Tim Holt Wilson, who has helped me understand the geology of Norfolk, because without him, I think I would have been in deep trouble. Now, the, the, the what does early or first mean? Um, I'm very much influenced by um, Stephen Hayward's uh, 2013 paper, in which he convinced me that actually there may not be a single parish church in Norfolk, which is actually pre-conquest. Uh, the ones that have been excavated have all proved to be wooden, and there isn't a single church that I can see that actually you can demonstrate has to be pre-conquest. Um, and a lot of the, the tooling on these early stones um, is in fact diagonal tooling, which is a Norman feature. So I would suggest that we best just use the word early and not get too bogged down in whether they're pre-conquest or post-conquest, and, and I'll be using the word early this evening. Next. Great. So the churches I'm talking about are far removed from something like this, which is um, a fine piece of 15th century um, a flint a flush work with lots of wonderful um, limestone ashlar. Now, really very little of, of the ashlar uh, like that would have been available in the period we're talking about, which is really the, the late 11th, early 12th centuries. Next. And what we have to do is to go back to this sort of thing where the only stone available for most churches was, was what was lo locally available, what could be dug out of the ground locally. And uh, flint um, coins are a, a characteristic feature of this early period. Next. Um, somebody has asked me this today ab about Great Dunham, and they said, surely that's a Saxon church because it's still of, full of Saxon features. Well, indeed, it has um, long and short work in the corners of the of the tower. Uh, you see quite a bit of Roman tile forming windows. Um, also, there's a, a triangular uh, west doorway and there's double, play, double sp splayed windows in the tower. But also in that same church are features that really do say it is post-conquest, that it is Norman. You've got a um, um, strip work uh, around the, the west door, which is characteristically Norman, and, and you have the, um, the chancel arch as well. So it really is post-conquest, not by much, but perhaps by the 1090s. So um, we don't really know for certain anything uh, that uh, has to be um, has to be pre-conquest. 
Next. Now, <clears throat> so a lot of the stone, a lot of the, the, the corners were built with the uh, flint, either these larger, rather fine blocks or, um, um, next slide, conglomerate. Now I've got here um, the, the east wall of Bexwell Church, which I think a Victorian rebuild. That doesn't matter because if you look at it, you can see the two uh, brown stones that we need to discuss. Um, the, the big black blocks, could you bring up the big black ones? That's it. They are the iron conglomerate. Um, and the other ones, the, 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 the lighter brown sandy stuff is the cast stone. Now, for years, people have been confusing the two, but they're actually they're quite different. The conglomerate is uh, can be found over many parts of Norfolk. Cast stone is very much limited to the, the west part of the county uh, and really didn't spread that far to the east. But many guidebooks like uh, Pevsner and, um, and others, um, Mortlock and co, will tell you that um, you find cast stone all over the county. Well, you don't. That is really the iron conglomerate. Next. They're the Hunstanton Cliffs. I hope I expect everybody has seen those fantastic cliffs at Hunstanton. They're one of the great um, um, landscape features of, of the Norfolk. Uh, of Norfolk. And there you see the cast stone. And that is all then covered by uh, a thin layer of red chalk. And then above that is the white chalk. Um, so that's where you get the cast stone most obvious, but it does run all the way down the west side of, of the county, which makes it often difficult to distinguish between the, the, the conglomerate, which I'm talking about, and the cast stone. Next. And my interest, really, in, in this whole subject of the use of conglomerate in early churches came from looking at this uh, wonderful blocked doorway at Gately which is clearly formed, uh, neatly formed, out of conglomerate blocks, the gems, and over the boost wires at the top. Um, and maybe think, well, actually, how many of these churches are nor in Norfolk do have this stone? So I set about going to try and see almost every Norfolk church to see how many of them have this uh, conglomerate. Next. Uh, when you look at them closely, you see this is interesting that the lower stone is a mixture of the of the very flinty um, conglomerate and then above that is bedded sands with just with one or two flints in it um, but I'm describing them all as conglomerate really um, because they were used um, both used in these early churches next the best place to see it of course is at North Elm in the ruins there. And I would, don't really want to get involved in a discussion about the, the the date or purpose of this building, but it is, if you want to go and see conglomerate, this is a very good place to start. Next. It's very rough. Um, blocks have been used um, and you see a lot of flint in them. And then I'm quite sure that, that you wouldn't actually have seen this at the time. It would all have been rendered over with, with iron, with lime plaster work. Uh, we can see it now, but I think when it, these churches were new, um, you really couldn't see this. The inside and outside faces of this building, um, the, the walls are, <clears throat> are a full conglomerate, and then there is a, a flint core inside. Next. So <clears throat> when you start going around these churches, and I've enjoyed doing this enormously, Start at the west end, look at the west corners, particularly the northwest corner, because that will be the best place to see it, first of all. If you can find this stuff, there it is. And this is um, at Sustead. Um, and there are many examples when you start to look. Next. There it is again. And there's bedded, you see, partly fairly sandy and partly um, gravelly. Now, this is the first time I'll talk about diagonal tooling because if you look at the the upper part of the lower stone, you will see the the parallel marks which di <coughs> excuse me diagonal tooling, which is um, a Norman technique of shaping these stones. Next, where the um where the stone is really hard, then the diagonal tooling does show up well here. 
as at the northwest corner of Yaxham Church. But next. Many of them will look like this, really quite heavily eroded, corroded, so you, you can't pick out the surfaces, it's all gone. And when you go around these churches, you will find that many of them, the surface has eroded by quite a few centimetres in some cases. You see, but halfway up that, that, uh, that line of coins, the, there's a, one or two stones that have really been now well set back by erosion. Next. Ashby is a good example, and what's particularly interesting about this one is you've got the northwest and southwest corners <clears throat> are made of the conglomerate, but then if you go to the <clears throat> east end of the nave, next, there is the east end look. So um, although the, the chancel wall is in line with the uh, line of the south wall of the nave, <clears throat> you can see that quite clearly where the nave finished. Now, when you look at that church, really, the only evidence for its early date is the corners. There's nothing. The windows really don't really help you to understand how the church was first built. So, but by looking at the corners, you can quite quickly often get the uh, work out the footprint of the building. And if you've got the footprint of the building, you're quite a long way towards understanding it. So always go for the corners, particularly the west corners. Next. Um, in addition to the corners, you, you've clearly got, uh, an, in some cases, you have the doorways. This is um, a nice example of a blocked doorway at the west end of uh, Mannington Ruined Church. And you can see the conglomerate of Ruth wires going over the doorway, um, but mainly flint down the sides. And I don't think there's any ash, uh, limestone ashlar there. It's, it's conglomerate and, and flint. And this is really, these are the features you should look for if you want to see the earliest ones. Next, doorway where the top has gone, but clearly the, the jams are, are nicely preserved. Um, that's on midway along the south wall, I think, of that church. It's an unusual place to see a doorway, but you get them there sometimes. Next. That is a lovely example of, a, of an early doorway. I think it's all conglomerate, but a lot of it's rendered over. But where, where it survives, um, it is where it's exposed, it looks like conglomerate. So you've got the, the two jams there, and then limestone um, imposts have been put in. Um, and then the, the that provided a firm basis on which to uh, construct a wooden uh, framework on which you then put on the, the um, stonework on top to form the arch. That's really quite a good example of what they could look like. Next. Melton Constable. This is a wonderful church. <clears throat> it's amazing, really. Look at that doorway. Now, OK, there is a, a Victorian insertion into it, a mock Norman um, doorway put in by the Victorians. But the roussoirs around the top are really finely shaped. A good example of a <clears throat> original West doorway. But if you look higher up, please, Ian, you would actually see some of the wind, uh, two uh, narrow uh, vertical windows there, <clears throat> which have survived, um, partly survived, or cut away by a central window. Next. And this was, I think, was a rather wonderful discovery at um, Baronexter Aylsham. Look at that. Um, there is a, a nook shaft uh, <clears throat> made out of this uh, stone. Quite a quite fine sandy material had to be used to, to create cylinders. You don't often get cylinders formed um, with this stuff. And that's a rather nice example. Um, I think it's only recently become exposed as the um, the blocking of this blocked doorway has started to fall away. So it's a really rather exciting find. Next. Isn't that wonderful? I do like this one. Um, you've got conglomerate forming the sill and the two sides of the of a, <clears throat> a single splayed loop, and then the top stone you see has been carved out um, to form a curved top, and it looks as though it's a. I think that stone has cracked because I'm sure it is a complete stone, and that's uh, later cement filling. A rather nice example of where you can find them uh, as a window, and the next one is similar. 
look at where the architect put that <laughs> put that um, downpipe, which is a bit of a shame. But there is a similar example with a um, a nice narrow win um, single sprayed window with uh, a sill um, at the bottom and another stone carved out um, at the top. So a complete window there. And you don't get many of them as complete and as good as those two examples formed with conglomerate. Next. Now, I don't quite know whether this is as old, but it is a, com a complete window formed with conglomerate uh, forming a, a triangular head. <clears throat> Next. And really, if you want to see good examples, there's no better place to go than Bessingham, which is absolutely gorgeous example of an early church. You have the, the tower to the full height and you have um, corners um, in the southwest, northwest and northeast corners of the, the nave. They're all there. And it's interesting because that north wall of the nave, there's no trace of a window. And I think you, the more you see these churches, you more you, you realise how actually many of them, have, the, the lighting was very limited inside with very small windows. And look at that belfry. Our next one, look at that. What you've got here is a double double belfry window with a mid-wall shaft and triangular heads. And you've got a very fine um, strip work um, going over the over the uh, the windows and down the side. Um, and that's you see those on all four sides. So do go and see Bessingham if you don't know. It's a very fine example. Next. Grufton, this is, doesn't have a mid-war shaft. It has a, a, a column built of small pieces of stone um, supporting, again, uh, triangular-headed uh, openings above. Simpler, but really in its own way, just as fine. Yep. Um, the most fantastic uh, <clears throat> tower arches, really. Uh, one is at uh, Great Rybra, very fine piece of work there. And the other one next is at Yaxham. Look at that. Isn't that wonderful? And there, um, because there's not a, a loft blocking the upper part of the, the tower uh, wall, you can see the, see the upper doorway. Yaxham is a rather splendid building because it, the nave is very high and you've got all the corners um, and a very impressive early rather special building quite an expensive one to put up for its time yep Holt is one that puzzled me a lot I don't really quite understand it but there is the the southwest corner of the nave and that looks I think perfectly acceptable perfectly genuine early southwest corner of the nave and then if you look in the the northwest corner of the um the aisle there again is another good example um and the the uh the northeast corner of the aisle is also built of this conglomerate so it looks on the face of it as though we really do have um, a very early aisled parish church, which we hadn't really expected to see. Um, it depends whether you believe the southwest corner of the nave, which I think is fairly convincing, because that makes it quite a big building, quite a special building. And I don't think, again, oh yes, the um, there is evidence for um, uh, early window, uh, documentary evidence for an early window somewhere along that uh, north aisle wall. So it's not just the corners which make it convincingly early. There are openings, record of openings there too. Yeah. So where does this all take us? Well, this, I'll, I'll stop for a second speaking to give you a chance to look at this map to see what it shows. The obvious concentration is in the, the Aylsham area in the um, upper reaches of the River Bure, the, the Bure Valley, running down towards the Broads. There's another concentration, not quite as strong, in the Fakenham area, running down the, the Wensum Valley towards Norwich. 
and some of the river valleys to the west of Norwich have also got concentrations. Then there's an area to the south of the Broads. Then there's this big gap with hardly anything in South Norfolk and round up to the west, um, hardly any, except for Newton by Castle Acre there in the middle, but it is close to uh, uh, the Nar Valley. And then over in the west, you've got quite a concentration as well. Now, this is a very difficult area to, to work in, to decide whether you're looking at Carstone or whether you're looking at conglomerate. But I think I've got them all right, and these are all churches with early conglomerate. Um, again, not of them are close to river valleys, um, emptying into the in, emptying into the, the fens. So quite a nice outcome, really. I think it's a very satisfying outcome of this of this project to be able to identify the main source of the stuff, which is in the gravels of the river valleys. Next. Barrow Castle is one of the most spectacular monuments in the county. I'm sure you've all seen it. It's a, it's a wonderful monument. And it, it's always given me great pleasure because actually I negotiated the purchase of this monument for, um, for the Norfolk Archaeological Trust. So in a way, I've actually bought a Roman fort, which is rather good. <laughs> I enjoy doing that. Um, so th this is the south southeast turret. And if we look at that closely, you will see the surface is formed with layers of um, of wall bonding tiles, Roman wall bonding tiles, um, separated by areas of napped flint. And where the napped flint has fallen away, you can actually start seeing the Roman mortar inside, which is a mixture of crushed tiles and uh, lime mortar and I think they put in the crushed um, tiles so that the mortar would set more quickly because it would suck the water out of the uh, suck the water out of the mortar which enabled them to build these forts more quickly I suspect and that mortar is we call for some reason we call it opus signinum so we'll be looking at places now which have Roman um, tiles in them and also to show you some places where you can actually see the rope, the upper signinum as well. Next. The best place of all really to see Roman tiles in uh, a Norman, in a, in a Roman uh, building is to go to look at um, Caister on Sea. The Roman fort there has one building exposed with a hypercost heating system inside. And you can see that uh, the piles of tiles there have been used to uh, form the the hot air ducts under the floor uh, it's good to measure them because it'll help you and look at them closely because then you get a good idea what roman tiles look like and it helps you to distinguish between them and the much later bricks that you get in in churches next now i was fortunate enough um years ago to excavate um, a Middle Saxon well at North Elmham, which had about 2,000 broken t Roman tiles in the upper filling, in a 9th century filling. Um, and these tiles came from a burnt out timber building. We don't know what the building was. It was a timber frame building uh, with the spaces between the timbers filled with um, wattle and daub and bits of Roman bricks stuck in. Why they were stuck in, I don't know, but they were stuck in in large numbers. Um, in the gaps between the timbers and we had quite a lot of burnt daub actually attached to the tiles which showed the impressions of the the wattles and also the timber frame so anyway we measured all these tiles at the time and thank goodness we did because that's made quite a useful collection of measurements uh, for the, the sort of tiles that were available in the saxon period and later for um, reuse as rubble in, in churches. Now you see there were three peaks. There's peak A, which is about 20 millimetres, another peak 30 millimetres, and a fourth peak at 45 millimetres. But you can see actually a few tiles ran through to over 70 millimetres. So sometimes you do get very thick Roman tiles as well, but most of them are sort of 30 to 45 millimetres thick. So those are the thicknesses you need to look for when you start looking for 
Roman tiles in, in churches. Next. That is amazing. Um, <clears throat> there were 67 Roman, Roman tiles there from top to bottom. Um, a continuous line of, of tiles. Um, that's the southwest corner. The northwest corner has a similar number, I suspect, but it's heavily plastered over. Um, and there's a very good example, which I'm not going to talk about this evening, at Reedham, where lots of Roman tiles have been used. Again, it's go to the northwest corner or southwest corner, and there you can often get the early evidence for the first church on the site. Next. There's Caister. This is Caister Snedmond, um, which clearly has a much deeper bedding of, of mortar between the tiles and is not quite so impressive, but uh, they're all there, just the same. Yep. How is a special church? It really is. You can see the <clears throat> Roman tiles being used to help form the, um, the round-headed uh, double splayed window at the top and also the um, circular double splayed window below. So um, often if you get a blocked early window and there's not much evidence for it, you can often see Roman tiles actually showing um, as radiating voussoirs around the top of an opening. So the, the tiles can sometimes give away these windows even though they've been filled in. Next. Haveringland is a very special case where the, 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 there's a lot of uh, Roman tiles in the, um, in the fabric of this tower. And uh, then some nice um, loops there with uh, radiating uh, tiles around the top. And um, halfway down, just over halfway down, there were projecting tiles, which I don't quite understand. Um, perhaps that's an original sill. Anyway, almost entirely formed with conglomerate ore tiles, not many flints. So you can get flints and, uh, sorry, you can get conglomerate and uh, tiles used together to form these openings. Next. West Barsham. This is a, a star church, really is, is wonderful. And you see a lovely double spade window there. Um, the church has been heavily restored, but they've looked, they've been pretty good in, in ensuring that the, the openings are well preserved um, in the restoration. Again, you see nicely radiating Roman tiles around the top of a, um, a round-headed double spade window. Next. When you start looking at these tiles closely, you realise that there were several different sorts of tiles there all jumbled together. Um, I don't know whether Ian has his... Um, good, well done, Ian. <laughs> there it is. That is a very good example of a Roman roof tile. And you can tell that because the right hand edge has got an upturned lip, um, which is a sure indication that you have a roof tile. Next. Uh, this is how the tiles were formed in 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 Roman period. You you had the flat tiles with upturned flanges, which are called tegula, and then you have the curvy bits on top, which are called imbricks. The the plural of tegula teguli, I suppose, and the plural of imbricks, I suppose, is imbrices, but it's a very difficult word to talk to, word to to use. Anyway, so you want to look out for um, upturned lips for the tegula and curvy bits for the imbrex. Next. Back to Haveringland, and you can see um, upside down there, I think you perhaps uh, Ian can just point it out. There we are, is an upside down Roman roof tile. And notice actually the, um, the, the, um, the, the black interior of those tiles. So it's not fully oxidized right through. You often get that on Roman tiles. Next. Now, there we are. This is the west wall of um, Brampton Church. And halfway up, there are some herringbone um, lumps of, uh, of tile. And there, if Ian can point it out, we have one of the few um, in bricks that I've been able to find in these churches. 
they're much thinner than the tegulae, so they do tend to break up, but there it is. And they're going to hive up, of course, is a is a course of um, conglomerate. And all the time you find that you get the Roman tiles and the conglomerate used in these early churches. Next. Flitchum. Um, there was a Roman villa not far away for Flitcham and um, quite a bit of tile in the central tower of Flitcham Church and there mixed in with the tiles um, is and Ian has kindly circled it you can see a piece of opus signinum I wish we could focus in on it more closely but if you if you could you see the the little red specks of the Roman uh, broken up crushed tile mixed in with the mortar next that's a fine piece. It almost looks like a layer of concrete um, mixed of a tile, crushed tile and, and, and mortar, along with bits of tile and all sorts of things, Roman things in that uh, tiles in that uh, tower at Haveringland. They're a very fine example. Next. Surprising, actually, that you can, <clears throat> you also see it on, on churches like this. This is the south 14th century south wall of Sparham church and um mixed in there is a lump of obus igninum stuck to a roman tile now i imagine that uh, is an example of um of it being used reused several times it would i imagine have been originally in the um in the south wall of the nave and then it when that was taken down the rubble has been reused in a in a 14th century aisle wall so it's not just in early walls that you get the stuff. It is often reused later on. Next. Isn't that fantastic? A wonderful example of a north nave door made of Roman tiles. And they haven't really quite worked out how to get the structure advantage of having radiating um, tiles there. They, they got a bit of a hotchpotch in, but nevertheless, it still stood up. Um, quite a lot of Roman tile in that church. Now I'll come back to this one in, in a minute. Next. Uh, this is in the, the west wall of Hethel Church, which is an early tower, um, early square tower. And you can see the, the tiles forming the, the jams of the door and also forming the, uh, the, the head of the door at the top there. Next. And of course, we get a mixture of the tiles and the conglomerate sometimes in these corners. And this is a very good example at, at Intwood. And here again, we've got, I think, three of the four original corners of the church surviving, either of conglomerate or as tiles. I think they've got a mixture of the two in, in each corner. Next. Now, this is a Roman, as I say, in Norfolk. Um, that is a, a rebuilt Victorian corner, east corner of the chancel. And the, the Victorian architect decided to use Roman tiles. There's quite a lot of tiles in the church. And the, there is a, a Roman site not far away. And there on the left is the Victorian buttress. So there's no doubt that is a Victorian rebuild of the corner of the east and the east and southeast corner of the chancel. That's right. Thank you very much. If you could just look, do that again. The tiles of the um, corner there has run through into the buttress. So that isn't entirely is a um, Victorian rebuild with Roman tiles. Alter do not look at that. If you, you've got alternating layers of um perhaps three or four Roman tiles, and then a flint or two going right up. There again, yes. I sometimes wonder whether the Victorian architect who designed this had been to see Barrow Castle, where you have the layers of Roman tiles separated by um, layers of flint. But rather splendid. Next. So where are we with this one? Well, you clearly got a concentration of Roman tiles in churches to the south and west of Caestas and Edmund, um, which is good. 
you have a less dense concentration around Brampton, which is the Roman, uh, which is Norfolk's second Roman town. You have a general scatter over North Norfolk, um, and <clears throat> you have some over to the west. Uh, but I think it's it is the concentrations around Brampton and Caister which are most evident. Um, and also down at Reedham in the bottom right hand corner, you've got this extraordinary situation where actually you've got a church with a lot of Roman tile built on top of the site of a small Roman fort, which has been uncovered in recent excavations. I'm not otherwise talking about Reedham because we're waiting for the report on that dig by Mike Fulford to come out, but it will be quite exciting. I think Ian has now popped in another Roman Norfolk plan. Oops, it's gone. I thought we were going to see the other plan of Roman Norfolk. Doesn't matter. Um, we're moving on now to Castle Rising and this um, grey quartzite stone. You remember I showed you an example of this before the lecture started. Now there's some whopping great blocks of this stone forming the foundation course of the nave <clears throat> at Castle Rising St. Lawrence. And also you see quite large pieces also in the, in the wall facing. Now, we think we have found the, the source of this stone um, uh, uh, to the southwest of Castle Rising. Um, it was obviously mined in the uh, 11th, 12th centuries for this church and also for um, the castle because the main areas of the um, between the buttresses at the Castle Rising Church are all to filled with this grey quartzite stone. Next. Link Common, here we are, very undulating. And I'm so grateful to Tim Holt Wilson for pointing this out to me. Um, there we are. Thank you very much, Ian. There it is. And uh, there's a in the, on the, the road that <clears throat> runs along the south side of the common, you see there's a house there um, and there's a lay-by just to the south of that along the road and you can park there and then walk into the wood and you see how undulating it is, very pitted and lying about on the surface next are lumps of this stuff. And uh, indeed, the the block I the piece of I showed you early on came from quite close to this this block, and they are littered all over the surface. So this must surely be where the um, <clears throat> the quarry was. Um, but when now, okay, these stones were certainly used at Castle Rising in the eleventh, twelfth centuries. But next, <clears throat> we also think it was it is reused from Roman buildings. And here at Appleton, low down in the tower, you'll see quite a lot of large gray blocks of this stone. Um, and there is a close up of some of the stone and, and Ian has cleverly spotted the, uh, the stone you see on the left hand side um, in the tower wall. And <clears throat> there is a villa, Roman villa, not far away to the west called Denbeck Wood Roman Villa. Um, partially excavated by Raymond Raymond Clark in the 1940s. And um, that sadly has not been written up, but there are one or two old photographs of that excavation took, taken by Hallam Ashley. And in those photographs, it looks as though you can see blocks of the stone lying around in the excavation. So we've got it, therefore, we seem to have um, this great quartzite used both in the 11th, 12th centuries, and possibly later, indeed, um, much later in some cases, but also used in the Roman period and then reused in early churches. Next, the best known example of it, of course, is at Brancaster, where the lower courses of the chancel are made of these squared blocks. And how interesting that these are the squared blocks that you, you just saw also at Appleton. So at Appleton, they were coming from a Roman villa. Here they're coming from the uh, the Saxon shore fort, the Roman Saxon shore fort close by. So they're robbing the forts to build some of the churches uh, in along the north coast for Brancaster, from uh, the Roman fort there, Brancaster. Next. Burnham Deep Rail is this a church with an amazing a Norman font. 
Um, and in the tower, you can see traces of um, uh, belfry windows. I think that it would have been a, a double a triangular headed belfry opening. And you see the strip, strip, strip work there um, outlining the original shape of the window, as indeed you saw at Bessingham there when it was made with the conglomerate stone. And it's got two little sort of um, horns at the top. And then the strip work goes down the full height of the opening on either side. And this is the Grey Court site robbed from Brancaster Roman Fort. Next one. Now, um, Ian, if you'd like to put your cursor around the top of the loops there, can you just see there, down either side, you can jump there, up, up a bit to the right, that's it. That's it. You can see that there are traces of these stones um, there forming um, the surrounds for um, belfry windows on all side, but only on the east side um, is it well preserved. Great, thank you. Next. Now look at this. <clears throat> I just wish I could get up some scaffolding on top of that and have a close look at it. It looks to me as though that is that they've used Grey Quartzite to outline that, just as you saw at Burnham Deepdale. I can't be certain, but it looks like it from a distance, which is rather special. So you've got blind arcading there, and then you've got strip work outlining double um, triangular headed belfry window there in the middle. And above that, you have got um, some rather nice sound holes. Now this is well away, this is well to the east of the Rancaster Fort. But it wouldn't have been that difficult to to cut the um the stone along the coast but i think it's only in that strip work where you might be able to see it next so what does this all mean well here we are there's a distribution map and you can see uh um you can see the um concentration around castle rising and that was used, um, the using stone from uh, uh, Roman quarries there, um, um, and also in the Middle Ages. And then you see it at Brancaster, um, and also down at Reedham. And it's quite astonishing, really, to think that the the um, some of that grey quartzite was taken right round the coast there to build the Roman fortlet that we now know is under Reedham Church. Um, and next, there we are. So that was the way the, um, the Reedham Great Quartzite reached um, there from the quarries at Castle Rising. Um, it thought it would have gone down the Babingley River, um, either to Brancaster to build a fort there or right round to build a fortlet at Reedham. So you have to go in the great Roman estuary there and, and upstream to, to, to Reedham. For that fort, so that's quite a, quite a <clears throat> interesting development there that we can see Roman stonework being uh, transported over that quite long distance. Now we also have a rabbit to pull out of our hat. Next one. Um, <clears throat> this is Brampton, northwest corner of Brampton Church. Now look at that. There is Roman tile at the bottom, but higher up that is a sandstone and i looked at this and thought what on earth is it um it's only tim Holt wilson that can answer that question so i asked tim to have a look at it and he believes that it could well be thank you it could well be millstone grit now millstone grit was quarried in the roman period from the the crags of the east pennines now, when you think about that, that is quite remarkable that it should have been transported from the Pennines right round to um, right round to the Roman town at Brampton. Um, when I um, told, uh, I sent an email to to Ian about this. His email response back was, "What on earth?" Well, I fully agree. It's an extraordinary discovery. Um, if if Tim is online, I wondered whether you could possibly tell us. Um, um, yeah. Have you been able to identify it? Um, let me just get my stuff. Yeah. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Yep, yeah, that's fine. Um, 
Yeah, Norfolk's a really interesting place for ge the geology of church stones. Um, this, um, when you get up close to this material, um, you can see that it's made of um, mostly angular quartz grains, kind of medium coarse grains of quartz, and with a lot of weathered feldspar in between, which is like, uh, I suppose you'd say that it was kaolin, which is what feldspar weathers to. Now, the millstone grit is principally a um, feldspathic coarse sandstone made of quartz grains. And uh, it's got a few other minerals in it, sort of rare minerals. Um, it was derived from the erosion of granitic mountains in the north of Britain. And the debris from the erosion of these mountains was swept down into big deltas um, in the Carboniferous period. So we're talking sort of 320, 330 million, something like that. Um, and um, it was then deposited in considerable thicknesses. I think the millstone grit in Lancashire is something like 5,500 feet thick. And it's got variations in terms of texture and um, uh, and the um, content of, of clay minerals and so forth. But it's a distinctive thing. And um, that's my diagnosis when I saw it. And I thought, well, you know, could it be something else? Could it be, for example, Triassic sandstone? And there's a slight pinkish tinge to it. I haven't yet got up close enough to say whether that might be a pinkish alga. Um, but I think um, it's possible that it is actually uh, a pinkish tinge to the sandstone itself. And we know that some of the uh, millstone grit in the southern Pennines in particular has got a pinkish tinge because the, <clears throat> the overlying Triassic rocks, which were deposited, deposited, deposited in a desert um, in hot, dry conditions, a bit like planet Mars to some extent, um, very red. Um, and it, the red iron, the iron oxide filtered down into the millstone grit, lending it a, a pinkish or reddish tinge. Um, the only way to be entirely sure about exactly which formation uh, or member of the millstone grit it, uh, it comes from would be to take a thin section and then you'd have to find somebody who knew their millstone grit inside out because, as I said, it forms an immense quantity of um, hill uplands in the Pennines. Um, you know, the, the cappings of the... Um, Cappings of the mountains at Ingleborough, for example, those uh, flat top plateau in the northern Pennines. And then, of course, there's other areas around Leeds where you've got the grit stone, and it's very much um, Heathcliff and Cathy country, I think. Um, uh, pretty wild. Um, but the Romans, we know that there were Roman quarries. Um, uh, a colleague, Ruth Siddle, has um, done a little bit of background and she has um, pointed out some of the likely sources of this. So coming to York probably, down rivers near Dior or Swale, um, down into York and then being dismantled uh, during the Saxon times or early Norman times and then being brought round um, to Norfolk. Uh, so I think that's probably, I've said enough unless anyone's got any questions. Thank, thanks so much, Tim. Um, this next map shows you actually the route by which it must have reached um, Brampton. Um, there's a start in the, um, the, the crags in the Pennines uh, by river down through York. Um, and of course, it was used heavily in Roman York to, to build, a, a, particularly the, 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 the most famous example is the, the York Roman sewer, which was built entirely with millstone grit. And then down the coast and right round uh, to the Bure and up the River Bure to Brampton. Um, now, we understand that actually um, some of the uh, Brampton was a industrial town and a lot of pottery production went on there. I understand that quite a lot of it um, is, is found on Hadrian's Wall. So you've got um, industrial um, 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 products from Brampton going north to the wall, probably also, of course, with grain. There would have been a lot of grain moving um, from east from East Anglia and the Fens up to the up to the uh, to the Hadrian's Wall and and the, the troops there. So you can see there would have been 
quite a bit of movement up and down the coast. So it's not impossible, but this has come as a quite extraordinary surprise. And having got into the great estuary there, um, then you have to uh, nip, uh, you have to get it up the the Bure to Brampton. But you've got to remember that the sea levels in the Roman period are quite a bit higher than they are now, which is why they probably the river could have um, they probably could have got into the Bure through the the um, the north side of the uh, um, the island of Flegg. Thank you, Tim. Next. And just finally, because I nearly ran out of time, just a bit about windows. I do find these early windows rather wonderful. And um, we've talked about how they're used, um, often formed with the uh, Roman tiles. But when they're made, they're actually made with, with basket work. So a double spade window will have pointed um, two pointed baskets going into the centre of the window where there would have been a wooden frame. And uh, that only one case next slide please does the basket work survive and that's in the um the tower at the interior the tower at hale you can see the basket work there and next there is one example where a wooden frame survives where you can see the holes around it where the um where the basket work was pushed in now if there's any case for doing some radiocarbon dating it's surely on that uh, wooden frame at um, South Lopham. Next. And there's one place where the impression of the basket work I've seen, and that's in um, Framlingham Earl Church. Slightly lopsided basket, I think, but nevertheless, it obviously worked. I don't know what that is in the middle, but I don't think it's a wooden frame. So I think that's almost the last slide, is it? Oh, yes. And uh, Ian has produced this, which is of a double spade window with something in the middle. It looks like a frame, but it looks as though it's made of stone. So I don't really quite understand it. Um, but, uh, but there it is, whatever it is. Thank you. So my last slide is to go back to the my, my, friend, my, my central point that don't go by the windows, don't go by the doorways. If you want to find out which is the which churches are um, early, go and look at the corners, particularly the, the west corners. And I always start by going to the northwest corner of a church and then have a look at that and, and then, then walk around the church and see what you can see. So thanks for listening.